Hello, and welcome back to this, the third lecture in our series on cardiac arrest, hypothermia, and resuscitation science. My name is Dr. Benjamin Abella, and I'll be speaking to you today on cooling the body to save the heart and brain, or therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. This is a topic that has engendered a lot of interest recently, as it represents one of the most exciting new therapies in the care of patients whose hearts have stopped, or patients who have had cardiac arrest. As many of you may have heard from uh, the media and other uh, things in current events, people whose hearts have stopped and then been restarted often suffer lasting brain injuries and other disabilities after resuscitation. And this therapy, known as therapeutic hypothermia, or the lowering of the core body temperature after resuscitation has been shown to dramatically improve both survival as well as brain recovery after cardiac arrest. So we'll explore this topic together, but before we plunge into the science surrounding hypothermia, I wanted to give you the big picture of when people actually die from cardiac arrest. So this is a schematic illustration showing that if you have a set of patients who suffer a cardiac arrest, Despite all the initial actions of resuscitation that we talked about in the first two lectures, such as CPR and defibrillation, most of these patients go on to die, and they go on to die fairly suddenly, meaning you do CPR, you attempt resuscitation, and you don't get them back. So you'll know instantly the results of your work if you're a healthcare provider. Now, it turns out that some people, of course, we do get back, and we call this ROSC, or Return of Spontaneous Circulation. This is getting your pulse back or your circulation back, and this is that moment that's very dramatically portrayed in television shows when someone's been shocked or gotten CPR and they wake up. Now, in truth, they don't wake up right away. They're critically ill, and they're often immediately placed into an intensive care unit, and then something terrible happens. Despite most of these people getting their pulse back and initially being resuscitated from cardiac arrest, most of these patients go on to die, and they go on to die fairly acutely after resuscitation, within 24 to 48 hours usually, after they get their pulse back. Now, this is a real problem, and it's one of the reasons why very few people actually leave the hospital alive. Now, just to give you a sense of the numbers from actual real-world examples, this has been looked at from cardiac arrest occurring in hospitals around the United States. And we found that we get about one in every two patients back initially. So we're batting about 50% for initial resuscitation from cardiac arrest. But only about one in five patients leaves the hospital alive. So this is a tremendous amount of mortality. Uh, and it's not just mortality that is the problem here. As I had mentioned, many people after resuscitation suffer crippling brain injuries. Some of you may remember the infamous case that was paraded around the media some time ago of Terry Schiavo. She was an unfortunate young woman who had a cardiac arrest event, was resuscitated, and then had significant brain injury following her cardiac arrest. And so those of us in the business of emergency care would not consider it a success if we just get patients back from cardiac arrest without recovering their brains. So we would like a therapy that both improves survival as well as improves brain recovery after cardiac arrest. If we had such a therapy, you could imagine we could shift this curve up and we could have many more survivors following such a deadly event. Now, it turns out that hypothermia, or the core body temperature lowering of patients after cardiac arrest, achieves this goal, and we're going to go into this in some detail. But first, before we talk about the clinical application, and some of the exciting clinical science, I wanted to give you a little bit of background, a little bit on the basic science regarding something known as reperfusion injury. Now, what is reperfusion injury? Well, it turns out that when you're in cardiac arrest, there's no blood coursing through your body. The blood flow is stopped. That's the, indeed the definition of cardiac arrest. There's no blood flow. Now, it turns out that the lack of blood flow is certainly a bad thing. But the restoration of blood flow, the sudden rush of blood after tissue is restored with blood, is also damaging. We call the lack of blood flow ischemia. That's the technical term, and you see there on the screen ischemic tissues. Ischemia is when there's no blood flow. So cardiac arrest represents whole body ischemia. And certainly, we all know having no blood flow is a terrible thing. But it is a little counterintuitive that the sudden return of blood flow, the rush of blood, after 
CPR and resuscitation is also injurious. This is called reperfusion injury. Now, this has been known for some time, this concept of reperfusion injury, and some of the initial clues about this problem came from the laboratory. And I want to share with you uh, an example of one of these laboratory studies. What you see here are a uh, photograph of heart cells. They're called myocytes, muscle cells from the heart, cardiac myocytes, grown in a Petri dish. So these are cells grown in the laboratory, and it turns out you can take uh, from an embryonic chick these cells. You can also take them from mice and other animals, and you can grow them in a Petri dish, and they actually will form a layer and start beating like a heart. It's, it's an amazing thing, but they'll behave like a heart in a Petri dish and beat in a rhythmic form. So you can see if they're healthy, if they're functioning, and you can do other sorts of measurements. Now, it turns out you can do another very interesting thing. You can simulate cardiac arrest and resuscitation by using these heart cells. And the way this works is cells in a petri dish are bathed in fluid. We call this media or culture media. And it contains nutrients and oxygen and other such things. Well, you can take these cells and you can bathe them in a fluid that has no oxygen. This is just as if you went into cardiac arrest and had no breathing and no circulation. And after a period of time in a controlled environment, you can then restore oxygen to this bathing fluid around the cells, and that simulates resuscitation. So this is a model by which we can explore how cells behave during cardiac arrest and resuscitation. Now, I want to show you a graph that represents cell death with ischemia and resuscitation. And you see there time and hours, and this is with heart cells. This is an actual study showing you actual data, where cells were made ischemic or without blood flow for one hour. And then on the uh, y-axis, you see the percentage of cells that might die. Now, there's two possible outcomes of this experiment where cells are made ischemic and then reperfused. One possibility might be that cells die during ischemia. Now, this might make sense. You have no blood flow. The cells start to die because there's no oxygen. And after a period of time, it reaches a maximum. And when you restore blood flow, the cells stop dying. That would be one hypothesis or one possibility from this experiment. The other possibility, perhaps a more interesting one, would be that cells don't die during ischemia, but die during reperfusion. So those are two possible outcomes of this experiment. This experiment was performed in our laboratory some years ago, and this is what we found. Indeed, it was the second hypothesis that was actually what happened. Namely, cells during ischemia don't die. In fact, they just sit there. They look healthy. But the minute you restore oxygen to the cell system, the cells start dying. Very counterintuitive. You're trying to make them healthier, you're giving them oxygen, and then they die. So why is this? Well, I'm going to use an example so that we can learn, is there something we could do at this point when we restore blood flow? And here's the example. Let's say you bought a car. This is an expensive Mercedes car. Let's say you bought this car uh, uh, at a price of $75,000, a very expensive car. So the question is, would you like that car? Many of you would say, sure. Let's now say that this car had one little quirk. It runs fine when it's full of gas. But if you run out of gas and it stops running and you refill the tank, the car blows up. Now, would you want to buy that car? No gas. You fill the gas tank and it blows up. That's exactly what's happening to cells in your body. No oxygen, you restore oxygen and they die. Very peculiar result, reperfusion injury. Now, what causes this? Well, there are a number of things that have been proposed to be involved here. One are uh, example of a mechanism are free radicals. Now, you may have heard of oxygen radicals or free radicals in the, in the media and the press. They've been implicated in aging and other disease processes. These are things like hydrogen peroxide and superoxide. They're molecules in the blood, in the cells, that can cause lots of damage. Inflammation may be part of this. Now, I show you there are some inflamed toes. Of course, in cardiac arrest, it's not the toes you're necessarily worried about, but it's an exa a visible example of inflammation, or the body's sometimes reaction to infection or stress. And a third mechanism that's been proposed for causing reperfusion injury is within the cells themselves. Within cells are these little structures called mitochondria. And some of you may remember from your high school biology class, mitochondria are the energy powerhouses of cells. It turns out they play a pivotal role in cell life and death and may be one of the causes of reperfusion injury. And I want to walk you through what this looks like 
When you take cells or organs and you deny these cells or organs blood flow, this is ischemia. Now, ischemia sets up a number of damaging pathways. These free radicals, also called reactive oxygen species, are created. You enable inflammation to start occurring, and you enable mitochondria to be dysfunctional, or the energy function of the cells to go uh, haywire, essentially. Now, when you take these ischemic cells or tissues and you reperfuse them, it turns out all of these things amplify. They get more intense, and they amplify quickly, within minutes of reperfusion. It's, it's a remarkable thing. You take cells, you reperfuse them, within minutes you start this cascade of injury that if you don't do something right away, it can become irreversible. Now, these mechanisms then lead to clinical things that we as doctors treating cardiac arrest patients have to deal with every time we have a cardiac arrest survivor. These mechanisms cause blood vessels to become unstable, and blood pressure becomes very unstable. Cells die, just like that example of the car that you put gas back in. One of the dreaded complications of reperfusion injury is brain swelling. This is also known as cerebral edema. Edema is a technical term for swelling. And this brain swelling can often be lethal. Or, even in uh, better cases than lethality, it can cause severe brain injury that can last. So these are serious problems. Now, to summarize several decades of laboratory research in one sentence, Hypothermia chills out all of these things. So hypothermia lessens reactive oxygen species, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. So an important take-home point here is that we don't exactly know how hypothermia works in the year 2012. There are a number of possible mechanisms, and a number of laboratory experiments have shown that if you cool cells or tissues, you affect all of these things to varying extents. But one of the very interesting things about medicine, some might say unfortunate things about medicine, is we often don't know why certain therapies work. First comes the understanding that it works at all. We use it. Meanwhile, scientists try to figure out why it works, and then we learn even more. And that's exactly where we're at with this therapy known as therapeutic hypothermia. Now, I thought I'd take a little diversion here and tell you a little bit of the history of hypothermia, because it's had a remarkable uh, and long-standing colorful history. So I want to take you back in time a little bit to some initial early inklings that hypothermia might have health benefits. So it turns out that many, many years ago, in the time of the pharaohs in Egypt, there was thinking about medicine. Indeed, medicine in ancient Egypt was very advanced. And um, some examples to give you a flavor of ancient Egypt, they had physicians, they had medicines that they believed worked, and they had deities that were involved in the process of healing. So they had a very advanced culture around healing. And it turns out that uh, in some medical texts from ancient Egypt, they actually felt that cooling people was good. They recognized that when people had fever, which is a form of inflammation or a manifestation of inflammation, hypothermia could be useful, or cooling could be useful. Also, they felt it had a role in helping pain. And any of you who have sprained an ankle and put ice on that ankle know that hypothermia or cooling, or the contact of ice, helps both pain and swelling, or pain and inflammation. So they recognized this a very long time ago. Now, you might wonder where the ancient Egyptians actually got ice. Uh, it was not easy for them. As you know, Egypt is a hot country. Um, but they had their ways. Uh, they actually were able to transport ice long distances by storing it in straw, and they would bring it. It clearly was very expensive and only for nobility, but it was well documented that they used ice for medicinal purposes. Now, let's travel a little bit further in time and further in space to Kos, which is the island home of Hippocrates and the Hippocratic tradition. Some of you who are not healthcare providers may have heard of the Hippocratic Oath. That comes from the island of Kos, where there was a physician named Hippocrates, who really in many ways was one of the founders of what we consider our medical tradition. And in ancient Greece, uh, there was constant strife, constant warfare between Greek city-states. And Hippocrates actually wrote about uh, an observation that when soldiers were injured and had traumatic wounds, they often did better when they were packed in ice or cooled. So he, like the ancient Egyptians, recognized that cold could help from serious and mortal conditions, life-threatening conditions. So this is not something new. Uh, of course, these were not randomized controlled trials like we like to see in modern medicine, and uh, uh, we don't know really how patients did, but it was well understood that hypothermia might have a role. 
Now I'd like to escalate our thinking a little bit more into the modern era and take you to France. And in France, in the time of Napoleon, and you see there Napoleon on the left, and by the way, I should point out a small disclaimer, I'm hardly a historian, although fascinated by the history of medicine, so if there's any historians watching this, I hope you'll forgive any slight errors in my interpretation of these facts. Nonetheless, in the time of Napoleon, Napoleon had a battlefield surgeon called Baron Leray. And Baron Leray was actually a remarkable individual for other reasons uh, besides hypothermia, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, he developed a number of important innovations in military medicine, including what we know of as the ambulance. He called it the flying ambulance. He recognized the need to have a transportation system better than throwing a patient on the back of a horse. And so he developed this cart where patients would be transported more quickly from the battlefield. He also was a social innovator, and this is a remarkable story having nothing to do with hypothermia, but fascinating to many, which is he recognized the importance of caring for anyone, even the enemies. Before his time, enemies were often left on the battlefield untreated, but he would care for even the enemies, and in here is a depiction of Prussian uh, recoveries from uh, battle, uh, hailing Baron Larray for his good deeds for caring for patients. He truly believed that being a doctor or being a healthcare provider, you cared for everyone. So, interesting stuff from Baron Larray. One thing he also noticed was when patients were seriously injured, hypothermia could be helpful. He noticed this in the Napoleonic Wars. And he wrote, cold acts on the living parts which may remain in a state of asphyxia without losing their life. So he recognized, and asphyxia is really ischemia, he recognized that ischemia could be treated by cooling, and, and he wrote about this extensively. Now again, not a clinical trial by any stretch, and that brings us to the first actual clinical trial looking at cooling patients after cardiac arrest. And this was done at Johns Hopkins Hospital during the 50s. It was a very small study, and it actually got sort of buried in the scientific literature for reasons that aren't entirely clear. But he found that these investigators, Donald Benson and others, found that actually if you cooled people after cardiac arrest, they tended to have a better recovery than if you left them normothermic or at normal body temperatures. And by the way, I should tell you, when we say hypothermia, we're not talking about cryogenics here. Some of you may have heard of the idea of freezing people or putting them in liquid nitrogen like uh, Ted Williams and, and others in the media. That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, when we say hypothermia, we mean a mild lowering of body temperature to about 32 degrees Celsius. So a mild reduction from 37 degrees Celsius, which is what we call normothermia, normal body temperature. So in any case, this was the first study showing a benefit of hypothermia in cardiac arrest. Now, some credit has to be given to this gentleman. Dr. Peter Saffer was truly one of the biggest innovators in cardiac arrest. He uh, trained at the University of Pennsylvania, where I currently work, and then went to Pittsburgh uh, to work there. And he was in many ways the founder of modern CPR, but he also developed hypothermia as a science. He went to the laboratory and he had animals that he treated with hypothermia and learned a great deal of what we currently now know as the science around hypothermia. And I want to show you this amazing diagram he created. He was very much ahead of his time. This was his algorithm for treating cardiac arrest victims that he came up with in the 60s that involved mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing, CPR, and you notice down there circled hypothermia. So as early as the 60s, he felt it should be standard of care that patients receive cooling therapy after resuscitation. Truly remarkable. It took a number of decades to figure out all the science of this and bring this to modern clinical practice. 